Open the pod bay doors now. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Good morning, Dr. Zimbardo. Greetings. So glad to have you. You can't see me. I'm a phantom voice behind you, but you can see the important people. They're so excited to hear from you. Uh, my name's Alexis Keys. We're so excited to present to you the final installment for this calendar year in our Science on Screen program. Great. Woo! Um, that round of applause also goes out to you all. This is easily one of our most well-attended Science on Screen programs. I will not delude myself to thinking it's just because of NZN. It's certainly because of this master psychologist uh, that we've got on Skype right now. Um, we're so excited to present to you um, the 2015 film, The Stanford Prison Experiment, which is based, of course, on the famous, infamous, sometimes referred to as notorious Stanford Prison Experiment, um, executed by Dr. Zimbardo at Stanford University in 1971. The tagline for his original experiment was the, a simulation study on the psychology of imprisonment. The study gave graphic illustration of the power of situations to shape individuals' behavior. Was anyone here a psychology student in college? Okay, we've got quite a few hands up, awesome. Um, I took one psychology class called Intro to Psych, and that's when I learned, okay, I heard same down here, I'm not alone. Who took one psychology class and learned about the Stanford Prison Experiment and was blown away? Awesome, okay, you're like me. Um, and thanks to this program, um, Science on Screen, we are able to present creative pairings of current, classic, cult, and documentary films with lively introductions by notable figures from the world of science, technology, and medicine. Each film is used as a jumping off point for a speaker to introduce current research or technological advances in a manner that will engage you. This program is presented in partnership with Science on Screen, an initiative from the Coolidge Corner Theater with major support from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Without them, we would not be able to be giving you these amazing programs, or we wouldn't have been able to Skype in Dr. Zimbardo today. Without further ado, I'll just say a little bit about the speaker. You all fam are familiar with him already, but as the voice and face of contemporary American psychology, Dr. Philip Zimbardo has made a career of giving psychology away for nearly 60 years. For this special installment of Science on Screen, the creator of the, of the Stanford Prison Experiment experiment himself, joins Enzian for a Skype discussion on how this landmark experiment shaped the course of his psychology career, including his current research on heroism. After the film, uh, don't leave because Dr. Zimbardo will return on screen for a brief question and answer session, at which time you're invited to step up to a microphone, which will be right next to the exit doors, and uh, tell him how this uh, experiment has now rocked your psyche, like it did the students in 1971. Um, I'm Alexis Keys, Development Manager here at NZN. We appreciate you all for coming. Without further ado, Dr. Zimbardo. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, uh, I will take 10 minutes uh, to introduce the film, uh, to give to provide a little background, and then I'll return in two hours uh, to answer any questions that you have. Uh, I should say it's remarkable to me that more than 45 years later, this little demonstration of situational power in a basement at Stanford University is still um, a classic, is still taught in classes. Uh, now we have this movie being shown around the world. Uh, so in one way, it's really exciting, except uh, uh, it has framed my um, image as Dr. Evil, uh, uh, and now, uh, now, as was mentioned earlier, I've made a switch uh, to focusing on how to create uh, everyday heroes with my new heroic imagination project. Please go online and check that out. Uh, the movie you're going to see is um, one of a number of movies made about the Stanford Prison Experiment. Uh, the, uh, the first one, I made a documentary in 1990. Uh, an academic one called um, 
the quiet rage, the quiet rage of sadism that guards have that has to be contained. Uh, I made it's a 50 minute documentary with black and white footage from the original study. Uh, and then in 2001, there was a movie made in Germany called Das Experiment, which was a terrible movie. Uh, it was no, I'm sorry, it was a well made, well made movie, but it it was so distorted. Um, guards killed prisoners. Guards raped. There was a female psychologist, which didn't happen in my study, uh, and the guard a guard raped her. Uh, and then at the end, guards the prisoners are having a, a mass battle. Uh, and it's 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 just violence, and none of these are college students. All the participants were middle-aged men, so it was just it was an excuse to use my frame uh, to promote violence and and sexism. Uh, and then in 2002, at the BBC, did a TV documentary, a docudrama, that cost a million dollars, uh, and uh, it also turned out to be not a very good study. Uh, it was a four four-hour uh, TV presentation by the BBC. They used a million dollars to create a real prison with, you know, electronic doors and things. Uh, but uh, the terrible thing was all the participants in the study who were recruited from around all of England knew that they were being filmed for a TV program. So that, that, that inhibited their behavior. I mean, the guards didn't do any abusive things to the prisoners because they knew at some point they would be seen all over England, uh, their friends and family. And in fact, in that study, uh, the, the prisoners took over the, the, the prison, uh, and, uh, and it was just, was just awful. In 2015, as you know, uh, a movie was made, um, a good movie uh, uh, that, that I had been working on for many, many years. Uh, called the Stanford Prison Experiment. It won many prizes at Sundance Film Festival, where it was featured uh, two years ago. Um, uh, best best trans a translation of a science uh, science into film. Uh, best screenplay. And I work. I was the consultant. I worked closely with Kyle Alvarez. He was, he's young a young a director. And this is his first major uh, movie. He also did the editing and casting. The casting of the prisoners and guards is brilliant. Uh, many of the, these young actors have already gone on to be, uh, are going on to be famous uh, uh, young actors. But but dynamics between them are really amazing. Kyle shot all the scenes of the prisoners and guards together, separately, two weeks before they began to shoot scenes with my act, the person who played me, and, and visiting by family and other uh, he wanted to cre create that intense relationship between the prisoners and guards, and you'll see it, it comes across. Um, I'd say the movie is about 90% accurate. The most accurate thing is the physical re reconstruction of the, of the Sanford base is identical to the millimeter. They sent a crew down to videotape, and then they recreated that prison. That prison. So when I was on set in Hollywood looking at, at this... Uh, at, uh, at, the, at the setting and comparing it to the the original 1971 setting, I couldn't tell the difference. Uh, the only major difference uh, between the real study and this and, and, and movie, and this is what I'll end, is uh, we was the experiment was supposed to go for two weeks, uh, but it, we ended it in six days. I probably should have ended it early because in in, in 36 hours. Prisoners began to have emotional breakdowns because the guards were being creatively evil and sadistic, uh, 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 taunting, humiliating them. Um, and um, what happened was, at, at, on the fifth day, uh, my girlfriend, Christina Maslach, who had been my thesis student at Stanford, who was just a new professor at Berkeley, uh, and we had just moved in together, as you'll see at the beginning of the movie, uh, was saying, we're going to live together if it works, we'll get married and have children. Uh, she came down, and what she saw was horrific. She started uh, crying, and I, I couldn't understand that. And she said, these are not prisoners, they're not guards, they're boys, and they are suffering, and you are responsible. And then she said, you have been changed by your situation. You have become the superintendent of the Stanford prison, uh, and, and you're allowing suffering. And then she said, if this is the real you, I don't think I want to continue my relationship with you. And that's really heroic. She's saying, I'm willing to give up that. She never said, you must end the study. She just 
to force me to come to my senses. And then I said, you're right, we'll end, I'll end the study tomorrow. This was already late at night on, on uh, th uh, Thursday night. So we ended the study the next day. In the movie, we have that argument, but I don't say I'll end the study because the Kyle Alvarez said, then the movie is over. As soon as I say, I'll end the study. So what he, ha he she leaves, I go down to the basement and I'm looking at the TV, a video of what's happening. And you see 10 minutes of what really happened, but it's, it's a combination of what happened on two different nights. It's the most intense um, uh, interaction of prisoners and guards, all of which really happened. Uh, guards um, uh, forcing prisoners to commit sodomy uh, and, uh, and doing other horrible things. So I'm saying oh, that really happened. And, and then, uh, so it gives the audience a chance to see the, the, the buildup of intensity in that study. And then I, I go in and I say, the experiment's over, uh, you know. And, and then what's not shown clearly is uh, we then spent an hour or more with all the prisoners and all the guards and prison guards there in debrief, having everybody talk about their, their guilt, their shame, uh, and, and, and their responsibility and what the study showed. And then I brought them all back two weeks later because uh, we wanted to be sure that there was no negative effect, lasting effects. Of, the, of this horrible experience. Anyway, I hope you'll enjoy it. Um, and um, uh, I'm ready for questions in the movie's exactly two hours. Okay, we would love to welcome back Dr. Philip Zimbardo to the Skype screen. Wow, does anyone else feel things after seeing that film? Um, we would love to hear your feedback. There's a microphone set up. Shay, the house manager, has her hand up. There's a microphone set up right behind you. So we won't be carrying a mic around to you all. If you would, just line up right behind there. We're really eager to hear what you have to say. Um, I would like to give Dr. Zimbardo a few moments to bring all of what we just saw into a little bit of context. Yeah, so as I said, um, 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 about 90% of what, what you saw was uh, an ac accurate, uh, really documentary drama. Um, uh, uh, there was very little um, uh, added to make it more dramatic, given how, in fact, if anything, what you saw was a two-hour excerpt of what went on for six days. Uh, so there are, there are actually many things that uh, had to be left out, uh, some of the drama of the... Uh, uh, so, so typically what they did is they showed one instance, like of the parole board hearings. Uh, you only saw one, uh, Carlo Prescott uh, uh, attacking one boy. But the parole board hearings went on for two days and there were many very dramatic things. Uh, visiting days uh, where parents were overwhelmed seeing their son looking so terrible after only a very few days. Uh, we only showed one instance of that. Uh, so I'm saying, un unlike most Hollywood movies where they are um, exaggerating, or adding in uh, extra drama, in this one, if anything, uh, they, they didn't have time for all the drama that actually took place. I noticed that you changed your shirt. Why did you do that? Uh, well, no, this is, this is my positive shirt. So now uh, I went from being Dr. Evil to uh, uh, being a Superman. Uh, Creating, creating youth heroes around the world. That's my new mission in life. Beautiful. Definitely deserves a round of applause. So to try to ensure that we get as many questions asked and answered as possible, um, I might do a little bit of interjection. But other than that, Nevin, please take it away. What's your first question for Dr. Zimbardo? Um, yeah, it would be good if you mention your name and something about if you're a teacher, student, you know, what you do so I, I get to know who you are. Uh, yes, my name is Nevin. I actually work here at the Enzian as a, <laughs> a property manager. But I just have a simple question. If uh, you were to recreate the experiment, uh, one, would you at all? And two, if you would, uh, well, what would you do differently? Oh, yeah. um, well, again, 
this, this experiment can never can never be replicated again because <clears throat> um, um, it and the earlier study by Stanley Milgram <clears throat> um, clearly uh, people su suffered were under stress. So now those studies are examples of unethical research. Now, <laughs> what I should say, however, is that my study was approved in advance by the Stanford Human Subjects Ethics Committee <clears throat> on research because in advance of the study, they couldn't imagine uh, the, these terrible outcomes because it was just boys who knew they were in an experiment playing prison at guards, like kids, boys playing cops and robbers. Um, so, um, and every, everything that they asked us to do, we, we, we complied with. Um, uh, you know, so for example, um, they said, um, in, uh, because there's no windows uh, and only one door, in case there's a fire, you need to have fire extinguishers. And the guards use the fire extinguishers, as you saw, spraying on the prisoners, you know, uh, the, the icy cold carbon dioxide. Um, so um, what I would do differently if the study was allowed to be done, I would not play the role of superintendent uh, of the prison. I would only be the principal observer, uh, uh, investigator. And, and there would be an ombudsperson, somebody not connected with the experiment, who could blow the whistle on it. Uh, who would say, it's gone too far, uh, we have to terminate it. Uh, now, the, again, the Human Subject Committee could have, should have had us send our videos each night so they could, they could look at them and evaluate it. But once they, once they said, it's okay, it gave us to go, then they, did, they never checked back to see how, how it was, in fact, going. Uh, so the study also should have been ended when the second prisoner had a breakdown. Because when the first one did... Um, uh, 8612, Doug Corpy, we didn't believe it. We thought he was faking. We thought, it, it, how could it be in such a short time uh, that, uh, you know, that he went, uh, you know, he went over the top. But when the second prisoner broke down, you know, you pr we proved the point. The power of the situation is dominating s smart, intelligent college students um, uh, in this extreme way. Uh, again, we also thought about what would happen if you had women uh, as prisoners and guards. Would you, get, would you get a similar result or very different? So unfortunately, there are a lot of interesting questions that can never be answered in this kind of research. Good. Thank you. All right. So hi, my name is Charlotte Jones Roberts, and I'm actually a professor here at the University of Central Florida in Orlando. And actually, well, the first two questions I had were kind of addressed, but I guess my next question would be, um, of the subjects who actually participated in the study, um, did any of them eventually come back out and contact you? I know the end of the film said that they weren't, you know, permanently damaged, but was there anything else that they ended up talking about to you that you were aware of publicly? Well, as I said, you know, we, we had all of them come back uh, uh, two weeks later because it, in those days it took two weeks to, to develop the, the one-inch Ampex video. So we, we showed them and we discussed with them. And then... Uh, the study actually, uh, even before I, I wrote it up, the study went uh, into the media by cu two curious coincidences. Um, uh, the day after the study ended uh, at uh, San Quentin Prison, which is an hour from where I live in San Francisco, there was a dramatic alleged escape attempt by uh, George Jackson, an African-American political prisoner, in which he was killed, but uh, he allegedly he smuggled a weapon into the into the uh, solitary confinement and freed freed all the pris prisoners there, and those prisoners killed some guards, and so it was a terrible si situation. Um, and three weeks later, in New York City, in Attica, there was uh, the prisoners took over the prison, in part as a. a uh, re uh, in honor of George Jackson, because they said it was a setup, he was murdered. And so suddenly prisons became uh, hot, because before that nobody cares about, nobody even thinks about what's happening in prison, even though, even though at this moment, 2.3 million Americans are in the prison system, costing us taxpayers billions of dollars. And again, the, you know, this is editorial, prison, 
prisons do do not rehabilitate. They create uh, worse worse um, a worse criminal. Uh, but because of that, uh, what happened was um, uh, um, I was asked to go on television to debate with the, the superintendent of Attic. Uh, I'm sorry, of San Quentin about what happened. Because one of one one of the reporters mentioned, uh, uh, did did what happened in in uh, San Quentin was it because of the dehumanizing treatment by the guards, as shown in the Zimbardo prison study, which which already was in the news a few days afterwards, <laughs> and then so we had we were having a debate on television, and somebody who saw that uh, was a writer for. Chronologue, which was the forerunner of 60 Minutes. And he asked me, do you have any videos? I said, yes, we do. And so uh, next month, there, there was um, uh, a 20 minute documentary on the Stanford prison study before I had written any scientific articles. Uh, and I think that was 819 did a bad thing was the name of it. So, so, so the, and, and then, uh, uh, I was invited to give a, um, uh, a testimony to the Senate Judiciary Committee. Now, I knew nothing about prisons except you know, I, I, I taught a summer course at Stanford to get some familiarity. Uh, but essentially, uh, prisons became hot uh, in, in the 70s uh, because of Attica, because of San Quentin. Uh, and and, and I, I, I fell into that, that hot water stream. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, Dr. Zimbardo. My Hello. name is Christine, and uh, I was originally trained as a clinical psychologist many years ago before I switched careers. And um, my, my question regarding your theory is that, as I understand it, um, you believe that many times instances of atrocious and just egregious behavior are due to situational factors as opposed to dispositional ones, as opposed to one's character, as it were. And my, my question from a clinical stance is that um, I think most clinicians will tell you that what separates relatively healthy people from pathological people is that people who uh, are pathological generally tend to externalize blame. It was never my fault. It was simply the situation that I was thrust in. And I'm wondering if you have any concern that these theories might, in, in a sense, thwart critical self-analysis and self-growth in that um, you know, it, it, they can be used as a cop-out in a sense. I mean, anybody, I'm not as bad as the next guy. I mean, I may not be a hero, but anybody would have done what I had done in that situation. In other words, I, generally speaking, I think that I wouldn't deny situational factors, but I would generally think generally bad things are done by bad people and, and they need to own it, is what I'm saying. Yeah, that's, that's really a good point. Uh, um, let's see, uh, there's several ways to answer is, um, I mean, our main point is that what we have demonstrated is <clears throat> when you put good people in a bad situation, the good people don't change the, the bad situation to make it better or good. The bad situation dominates, overwhelms good people. In my book, The Looser Effect, uh, I have 10 chapters on the Stanford Prison Experiment uh, uh, chapters on uh, the uh, obedience research by Milgram. Uh, I look at uh, evil in Bosnia, Rwanda, et cetera, et cetera. And in all these studies, it's the majority of people, the majority, uh, anywhere from, from two-thirds or even 90%, who end up doing bad things. Now, on the other hand, there is a minority, 10, 20, 30%, who somehow resist the, the situational power. And nobody studied them because we focused on the evil, which is more dramatic. Uh, but the good news is there are always some who, you know, there were guards in Auschwitz who did not, did not do horrible things to the prisoners, who often did little favors. In the Milgram study, two out of every three people went all the way to 4 to 50 volts, but one out of three didn't. In my study, there was some good guard who did not uh, harm the prisoners. Unfortunately, they never did anything to make the prisoners' life better, but they didn't make it worse. Uh, so, 
And so in my loser effect in chapter 16, I raise the whole question of ordinary heroes. You know, are there people who can transcend negative situational forces to do good uh, or not to, not, to, not to do evil, not to be drawn in? Now, the other part of your question is, uh, is, is saying, uh, I did it because of the situation, isn't that a cop-out? Is that, is that externalizing, blaming, blaming uh, the, uh, the external? Um, and to some extent, it, it could be. Now, if you're a clinical psychologist, you're dealing with, again, extreme individuals. But, uh, now, uh, a few years after I did, uh, no, I'm sorry, in 2004, what we, the world was shocked when we saw these hor horrific prisoners, uh, horrific photos of Iraqi prisoners being uh, abused, taunted, sexually abused by American prison guards in Abu Ghraib prison. And again, I got involved because of the similarity between what those guards were doing and what my guards did. Uh, and I became an expert witness for one of the guards who was uh, uh, in charge of the night shift, Chip Frederick. And in my testimony in his trial in Baghdad, I was able to say, Your Honor, Chip Frederick is guilty as charged. What he did was reprehensible. However, in my expert opinion, from everything I have studied about him, his family, the situation, I have to say I am 100% certain he never would have done what he did had he not been put in that situation, in that, in quote, bad barrel by by uh, the military police uh, si uh, system he was working on. And therefore, the severity of his sentence should be reduced or mitigated. So it's the first time there was a social, there has been a social psychological uh, impact in a, legal, uh, 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 in a legal trial. And they reduced the sentence from 15 years, which they had, they had wanted to give him, to ultimately only four years. He did serve four years, hard time, so he did, he did pay for what, what he had done, but, but so I was able to say, you know, in, in his case, every one of the nine guards on the night shift did terrible things. No guard on the day shift did terrible things because the guards at the night shift were instructed to abuse the prisoners. They were instructed to uh, take the gloves off, the euphemism, so that when they were interrogated, they would uh, spill the beans. They would give intelligence about uh, about the terrorism that was going on in Iraq at that time. Um, so, is personality and situations are always interacting, and and as a clinical psychologist, you have to weigh how much of what I see before me in this client, in this patient, uh, is some defect in them. Uh, uh, and how much is it the situation in which they've grown up? Um, uh, in, you know, again, situations are also poverty. Situations are also growing up uh, in an inner city, uh, growing up uh, in, in, in conditions where everybody around you is doing evil deeds. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Um my name is Liz, and I'm not a professor or a student, I'm just a nurse. But I was interested in um, if you had any, anything memorable from the experiment that showed a bit of heroism um, instead of the gruesome, you know, authority yeah. type things that happened. If there was any shine of light um, that could maybe demonstrate humanity's little tendencies towards doing the good thing. Yeah, um, I mean, there's only, there's only one, is one and a half. Um, uh, that last scene where, uh, where um, uh, John Wayne Guard is trying to get the prisoner to use an obscenity. So the the that, that prisoner was called, nicknamed Sarge, because he was so military. Um, he was really a, a wonderful boy. He, he, was, he was poor. He was living, he was going to summer school, living in his car. 
he did not he, he could not afford an apartment uh, and so the me the, the horrible food we gave him uh, as a prisoner he thought it was wonderful because it's better than he was getting uh, and living living in the streets but he was a very moral person and um, and and so uh, for example uh, if if the guards made some prisoner do something, you know, like do ten push-ups, he would say, uh, and and the prisoner was weak and skinny. He would say, "I'll do ten for him." So he was the only one who showed any compassion uh, to other prisoners. Uh, but then what the guards did is they used it against him. They said, "Okay, well you do you do his ten, and he does twenty more." Uh, so the guards always figured out a way to break down any. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, support among uh, between prisoners, any camaraderie between prisoners, and then uh, he, he was also very moral. He refused to use obscenity, and and that was that was the last kind of control that the John Wayne Guard couldn't deal with, because he, he wanted he wanted he wanted to dominate uh, uh, everything that everybody did, and you saw he went on and on, and that that, that was exactly verbatim of what happened. Uh, to get him uh, to use the word bastard, uh, and and a kind, of, and so I'm saying, here was a kind of heroic attempt of this one guy to resist the system, but the other prisoners, you know, didn't support him. So again, also the prisoner did other prisoners did anything uh, where they refused, like uh, 416 refused to eat. So they said, okay, if he doesn't want to eat. That's his business. Uh, uh, none of none of the other prisoners in his cell are going to get uh, lunch, you know. So then they st the prisoners start attacking him. Um, so so that uh, let me see what else. Um, um, now the, the one heroic act that you did, as I said, you didn't see in the movie was of Christina Maslach, because what she so heroism is uh, uh, taking an action. Um, uh, in support of some moral principle or to help others in need, aware that there is a personal risk and a personal cost. So altruism is heroism light. I give I give money to uh, to um, Red Cross. I give I give blood to a blood bank. Bank, but it, it's 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 it, it's not it's not a big cost. So what what she was saying really is, if you don't end this study, I am not going to continue living with you. I'm not going to continue my relationship with you. So she's willing to sacrifice, make a personal cost, you know, change her life style uh, because of this moral principle, whether or not this experiment should be allowed to continue or not. So, so that's that's really a dramatic instance of of what qualifies as, as heroism. And the good news, I should say, is we got married next year in the Stanford Chapel, and we had uh, this August is our forty sixth wedding anniversary. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Stephanie. I am a behavior analysis master student at Rollins. Um, and I had a question about the experimental design. Um, it seemed to be more of a case study structure where you just, right. the only real control was the randomization of guard versus prisoner. And I was wondering what methods could be used to isolate the variables a little bit better to see what exactly caused the guards to um, go off the rails, um, and what variables could be isolated to figure out what would make them heroic and what you've seen towards that. Yeah, it, 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 yeah you're absolutely right. It's a demonstration study. It, it's the only thing that makes it an experiment is the random assignment of participants into the role of prisoner and guard. Uh, and then we put them all in the same situation. Uh, now, we did not have a traditional control group would have been uh, uh, people who applied for the study who were not included, uh, who were on, let's get, put them on a wait list, uh, and then compare, compare their behavior. Um, um, but so it, it's really a demonstration study rather than it's called an it's an it's called an experiment in part only because, as I said, the random assignment to prison and roll guards. Uh, now again, what's uh, the more see the amazing thing is that after two days, nobody used the word experiment again, 
It was a prison run by psychologists. So really, in their minds, uh, they knew they were in an experiment. They filled out a, they, because of the human subject committee, they filled out an informed consent. You know, I, I so-and-so, agree to be in this study that could last for two weeks. Uh, if I'm a prisoner, there'd be minimally adequate uh, a diet, there'd be uh, high stress conditions, et cetera, et cetera. And they sign it, and that's the informed consent. And I get $15 a day uh, for my participation. So they knew it was an experiment, uh, but but we, I, we did things to make it feel like a prison. You know, uh, again, they didn't show enough of it in the movie. Uh, I, I had arranged with the Palo Alto Police Department, my staff is in Palo Alto, to do a realistic arrest, go with a, a squad car to each, uh, the, where each uh, of the uh, prospective prisoners was staying, make arrests, bring them to the, uh, uh, a real jail, put them in a real jail cell, uh, and then we had a real prison chaplain come down, we had parole board here. So we did many, many things that created the psychology of imprisonment. Uh, and, and, and so, um, you know, so for example, the Human Subject Committee made me agree that any time a prisoner said, any time anybody said, I quit this experiment, I would release them. Nobody ever said that phrase. They said, I want a lawyer. I want to go to the parole board hearing. I want out. Uh, so, so again, it's, it's uh, the, the psychology of the situation was they were prisoners in a prison run by psychologists, not they were in experiment uh, testing psychological uh, theory. Thank you. Hi, I'm Maria. I'm an English major. Um, I just wanted to know what made you initially think of studying situational versus dispositional factors in this way? Like, what was the thought process behind beginning and forming such a specific environment for this? What, what, were, you, what were you thinking? Like, oh, okay, two things. Um, um, <clears throat> so I was a, I was a situationist as a child, is in part. I grew up in poverty in the South Bronx in New York. Uh, and any, any kid who grows up in poverty knows uh, that in that situation, uh, people, kids are tempted to do things for money. And there are always evil guys who will, who will give you money to, to run drugs, sell drugs, uh, uh, steal, uh, break into stores at night, essentially. Uh, and, and some kids did and some kids didn't. And I mean, obviously I didn't and some friends you know, so I was curious always about human behavior as a, as a little kid. Why do some people give in to temptation, others not? And, and even there, I thought it had not, not to do with their personality, but it had to do with their family. Having a, having a mother who had a moral conscience, who was loving and caring, uh, made, it could make a difference. I knew it did in my case. Uh, and then interesting thing happened. Uh, um, when I was a teenager, my family moved from Sever from New York to uh, Hollywood, California, because my father's family all lived out there. And I was a very popular kid. Um, um, I mean, I worked I worked at being um, always a leader, always popular. And and then when I went to North Hollywood High School, I was shunned for one year. Nobody talked to me. People avoided me, and I didn't understand that. In fact, I developed psychosomatic asthma, and it was the reason my family had to go back to New York, because we didn't have money for, for medicine. And when I went back to New York, I went to James Monroe High School in the Bronx, and one of my classmates was a little, a little Jewish kid named Stanley Milk. And, <clears throat> and what happened was, uh, three months into senior term, I was voted the most popular boy in the senior class at James Monroe. I was, quote, Jimmy Monroe. So, so I talked with Stanley. How could it be that three months ago I was the least popular boy at, at um, uh, North Hollywood High, and now I am the most popular boy? Did I change, or did the situation change? And Stanley Milgram and I said, no, it was a situation. The reason I was shunned in, in North Hollywood is that they heard that I came from New York and I was Sicilian, 
and therefore I must have mafia connections. And they were afraid of, they were afraid of me, you know. And I was a skinny, actually a skinny little kid. I mean, so so it was. So here's the, the worst, you know, first aspect of prejudice. Uh, but Stanley, as you know, went on in 1960s to do the famous studies of a blind obedience to authority. So he was the first to demonstrate and his uh, demonstrate the power of situations. And in his study, he didn't use college kids. He used men mostly, adults, ages 20 to 50, and he had one group of women. And, and that was the classic showing that two out of every three people blindly obey an authority figure. Now, in my study, you know, I didn't want somebody to say you must continue to harm somebody as a, as a Milgram study. I just wanted to create a situation where people are playing a role. And that in that role, there's some, there's some uh, variation about what you can do as a prison guard or not. Uh, so, but, but his study and mine are really bookends of the power of the situation. His is it's a single authority figure demanding uh, a, a action that goes against conscience. In mine, it's putting you in a role in a setting where in that setting, being a prison guard means, you know, that means that you have a, extreme power over prisoners. I think I'm going to have to go. I think our time is up. OK, thank you, thank you so much for your time. Um, I was going to uh, do a time check after that question, but you've answered that question for us. Um, that was our final question that we were able to take from Dr. Zimbardo. Um, if you all would, just take a moment and let's thank D Dr. Zimbardo for his time and expertise. Uh, let me give you a few follow-ups. Uh, I did a TED talk in 2007 on the psychology of evil, in which I, I talked about the prison study, Abu Ghraib, uh, and then I introduced at the end my ideas about uh, looking at how ordinary people can become heroes. And then if you go online, uh, www.prisonexp.org, prison it has videos and everything about the Stanford prison study. And then the last thing is heroicimagination.org uh, is about my new work. So I think those three things are a, a good follow-up of, of, of watching this movie. We agree. Thank you again. Have a good afternoon, and thank you all for coming.